Hello again, fellow time travellers, uh, members of this community, this growing community that travels through space and time together. Um, I always like to, mostly I suppose for people who are new to the community, uh, just to say that uh, history is my uh, sanctuary. It's where I go uh, in search of parallels for whatever's happening in our time and place. Uh, when I find things in the past that, that remind me of what's going on today, uh, I get a reassurance from watching how events played out uh, and perhaps more specifically paying attention to the way the ancestors, the forefathers, muddled their way through that same situation. So that's why history matters to me and to this uh, to this community. Uh, I like to thank at this point everyone who has become part of the Patreon community. Here's how it works. Uh, you go to patreon.com, look for me by name, Neil Oliver, follow the instructions, part with some cash on a monthly or an annual basis, and from that point on you're a member of the community. Uh, you're one of us. Uh, you get access to exclusive material. Uh, there's a new vodcast that I film every week uh, with Paul's help uh, here in my home in Stirling. We run competitions from time to time and we take suggestions for special editions. So it's a community. That's a word that I'm using a lot. Uh, it's free, free thinkers, uh, history enthusiasts, history lovers, those who remain curious about what's going on in the world. And uh, this family of ours is growing in size all the time. And it would be great to have you along. So go to patreon.com, look me up, join up, become part of the whole affair. Um, now, though, it's time to strap yourselves into the time machine as we set off to the next stop on my love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. The golden ticket that you needed to get into Valhalla, where you would feast and fight all day with the gods. You needed to die a violent death in battle. In this podcast, we're heading to the capital of the fallen kingdom of Mercia. Wintering with the Mikkel Heathen Hera, the great heathen army of Danish, Swedish and Norwegian Vikings plotting, planning, and burying their dead. Mighty warriors slain with terrible injuries, buried with their weapons, and heading for Valhalla. A powerful army resting itself, readying itself for its next move, to sweep across the British Isles. I'm stepping out across Britain, to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me, and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver, and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Last week, Neil, we travelled with you to the Brook of Bercy, a tiny island well and truly trampled beneath Viking feet. Where are we now? Those folk on uh, the Brocha Bursi, those, uh, those Christian Picts, they, they had it bad, they had it rough. But there was much worse coming for people elsewhere in the rest of the British Isles. This week we're in a place that gives us a vivid, a bloody snapshot of a mighty Viking army halfway through a determined campaign to conquer the entirety of the archipelago of the British Isles. We're in Derbyshire, at St Whiston's Parish Church in the village of Repton. It's a quite different destination this time, in as much as the last couple have been little islands. The last one was the Brocha Bursi up in Orkney, and then one before that was Lindisfarne off the northeast coast of England. And the coast has a feel all of its own. Well, this one's in Derbyshire. So it's inland, we're inland for a change, and it's quite different. You know, you get that different sense of place when you, you know, when you're surrounded by the landscape. You, when you're not on the edge, when you're on the coast, you know, you, you feel as if you're on the edge of the world. Really, wherever the coast is, because you get that jump into the other world, which is the sea. Well, here in uh, Derbyshire, 
We're right in land. Specifically, we're at St Whiston's Parish Church in the village of Repton. And it's one of those places that has bundled within it several important nuggets. You're in amongst the Anglo-Saxon world and the Viking world. It's all there in what is, to all intents and purposes, an unassuming little backwater of a place that, that has fallen from most people's consciousnesses. Most people wouldn't have much of a reason to go there. But it is it's small. Yeah, and it's off the beaten track. It's not, it's not really on the way to anywhere. It's just Repton. You only go to Repton if you're going to Repton. It's not on the way. Some of the, the houses and buildings in the village are, you know, they've got lovely sort of mossy-covered roofs and eaves that are slumping here and there. And it has that kind of sleepy feel about it. And, you know, to be honest, you'd almost be forgiven for thinking that the way things are there now are the way they must always have been. If you just popped in there to, I don't know, pick up a newspaper or something and drive on, the significance of the place would understandably pass you by. In the middle of the village, there's a place where four roads sort of converge, and there there's a, a market cross that are sort of central to so many British villages. It's got an octagonal shape, so it's eight-sided, and then there's a set of steps go up, getting smaller all the time, so that the thing has this, the shape of like a wedding cake, you know, that's a tiered shape. And at the top of the of the smallest eighth step, there's a round column, and on the top of the column, there's a ball. So it's a central place in the village. It's also, according to some, it also marked the spot where Christianity was first preached in the Midlands. The point about the little market cross is that it's so worn. You know, the stones are, are worn smooth like a pebble that's been in the path of a stream since forever. In your mind's eye, you can almost imagine time as a river coming down those four roads, washing past the market cross, until now all the edges have been smoothed away. You just have this sense there of time having passed, and you'd be forgiven for thinking it's just a sleepy little village where nothing much ever happened. But in fact, the truth is, 11 centuries ago, Repton was the capital of the second most important kingdom in the old Anglo-Saxon world. We've discussed it before that when the Romans decided to bail out of the British Isles because they had bigger problems elsewhere, they couldn't really afford the upkeep of Britannia anymore. Uh, so they began pulling out in the 400s AD, the 5th century, and it left a power vacuum. And into that power vacuum were pulled, amongst others, Anglo-Saxons. They came across the North Sea from northern Germany and the, the low countries, you know, they were sort of pulled in from there. Initially, they came in at the invitation of the locals who were looking for a kind of mercenary force to help them maintain order. Because with the Romans gone, things started to fragment and get a bit chaotic and apocalyptic. So the Anglo-Saxons came in for that reason. But then as time went on and there were more and more of them in the country, some of them were ambitious men and, and decided to take control. And in the fullness of time, over the couple of centuries that followed the Roman departure, Seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms developed. Later, there was a 12th century historian, Geoffrey of Monmouth, and he first of all gave the seven kingdoms the name the Heptarchy. Hept is seven. But in any event, there were seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, sometimes on good terms with the neighbours, sometimes not, squabbling, intermarrying. It's generally regarded that the seven were East Anglia, Essex, Sussex, Wessex, uh, Northumbria, Kent, and Mercia. And of the seven, of the seven, Mercia was right up at the top of the league table. It would be generally regarded as one of the most powerful. And Repton was the capital. So in a way, they were a bit like territories ruled over by warlords. Y yeah, you call them kingdoms with kings. You could safely imagine that's how they regarded themselves. But you might well look back and regard them as, as warlords. Because in, you know, in most instances, those figures would have to be strong. Strong one way or another. Strong diplomatically, strong at fighting, combination of both. 
The situation was further complicated by the fact that, you know, by the time we're interested in, which is, you know, around about the start of the 7th century, the 600s, some of them were Christian. But Mercia resisted Christianity and was the last of the Heptarchy to receive the new faith. So it was, it was pagan. It remained stubbornly pagan for the longest. And obviously that put it at daggers drawn. But around about 600 AD, a Christian community, an abbey, was established at Repton. Mercia is close to the Welsh border and everyone's heard of St David of Wales. It may well be the case that the, that the abbey or the Christian community that was established at Repton was founded by him. And there's, and there's certainly a strong tradition that it was. Others credit an Anglo-Saxon king of Mercia called Pida, who established the abbey because he was trying to get on good terms with King Oswiu of neighbouring Northumbria, specifically because he wanted to marry his daughter, Alchfled. So there was some diplomatic manoeuvring going on and a, and a marriage was central to it. But because Northumbria was, was a Christian place and, and Mercia wasn't, then Christianity became a significant trade-off in trying to secure relations. So Repton Abbey is founded from 600 AD onwards. Mercy is an interesting word in its own right. It has its roots in Old English and Anglo-Saxon word Mirka, which means the men of the marches. And in that context, a march is a border between you know, a neighbouring kingdom or a neighbouring territory was called a march. And people might be familiar with, with the concept of riding the marches or people who defend the marches, and it's defending the borders. So Mercia comes from something to do with the men of the marches. And of course, the most famous king of Mercia was Offa. A lot of people will be familiar with Offa's Dyke, which is a ditch which was constructed during the reign of King Offa. And he was in charge of Mercia from 757 to 796. And he was troubled by the foreigners across to the west. And he was an Anglo-Saxon. And anyone who wasn't Anglo-Saxon in the Anglo-Saxon language was described as Welsh, not us. So Wales is the territory of the foreigners. And to draw a line in the sand between himself and those that he regarded those Western foreign types, he created a dike which still defines, to some extent, the Welsh border. I mean, it's a big earthwork, isn't it? It is. You can still find it. You can still see it. It survives in the landscape. You can still go and see Offa's Dyke even after all this time. So, sometime in the 7th century, Repton Abbey was established. It followed the rule of St Benedict, which was a, a way of living a Christian life in a Christian community that was imported from the European mainland. Repton was posh. It was an aristocratic monastery. It was called a double abbey, a double monastery, because there were monks and nuns, men and women, separately but together, living the, you know, the, the monastic Christian life, following the rule of St Benedict. The whole place was under the rule of an abbess. Uh, and because it was uh, Christianity at that point was the up-and-coming thing, it was the up-and-coming fashion, aristocratic noble families were taking it on board, and some of them were sending their sons and daughters to be monks and nuns in part because of the kudos that was associated with it. The first abbess of Repton that we know about was called Werberga, uh, and she was the daughter of Wulfira, the king of Mercia, and Ermelia, the daughter of the king of Kent. So, apart from anything else, some of the fascination with the Anglo-Saxons is the unfamiliarity of the names. It's got that Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones feel. You know, Pida, Oswiu, it's easy to imagine that they're fictional rather than real people because we don't ever hear those names. They are so foreign to us. Now, the, the one that we are interested in is Whiston. And St Whiston is another of these unfamiliar names. And I love the sound of that word. I love Whiston because it sounds a little bit like wistful. There's a, there's a whispering, melancholic sound to it. Whiston. St Whiston's is the name of the parish church that's there to this day, a modern parish church, which is to say it was built between the 13th and the 15th centuries. So it's not exactly modern, but it's modern by comparison to the Repton Abbey that was there before. Now, when Christianity was new 
everyone who was following it, there were certain things they had to, if you like, import. They had to get certain things together to function. And for Christians who were in the business of making other Christians, you know, converting and baptising other Christians, they needed a baptistry. Because, you know, if you were born and raised a pagan, in order to become a Christian, you had to be transformed. And in, in effect, you had to die and be born again. And this ritual took place in a baptistry with a font of holy water. Because just as a baby is cradled in a, in a womb inside the mother's body in liquid and is born from there, so the idea was established of a, of a Christian having to be immersed once more in holy water and to be brought forth from that holy liquid to begin a new life, to begin life once more. So a baptistry was a crucial element of what you needed. And at Repton Abbey, the first baptistry, or the baptistry was, was a timber building dug into a natural spring. There was a naturally occurring uprising of water at Repton, which may have inspired the location of the abbey in the first place. You know, the idea of this life-giving supply of, of water. And so the, the baptistry might have been semi-subterranean, dug down into, the, into where the water was rising and a timber building built on the top of it. And historically it would appear that the baptistry was only there for a relatively brief period. And then some or other king decided to transform the baptistry into a burial chamber. You know, kings are vain and narcissistic and... You know, and there's there's nothing they, they like better, a lot of them, than the idea that after they die, that you know that their that their bones or their mortal remains will be placed somewhere spectacular. So some or other king of Mercia had the baptistry transformed into a stone-built, semi-subterranean burial chamber. Uh, now the first king of Mercia that we know that had his bones interred there was Ethelbald. Is another cracking good name, Ethelbald of Mercia, and he died in 757. He was probably buried elsewhere for a while until his flesh had rotted away. And then his bones were dug up, just his bones, and these were washed and anointed with goodness knows what, holy oil. And then just his bones were placed inside this stone built crypt. And thereafter, this is 757 AD, and for a while after that, other kings did likewise. When they died, their bones were placed in there in a ceremonial fashion. King Wiglaf uh, was a successor of Ethelbald. He died in 839 AD and he was buried there too. Or not buried, his bones placed inside the crypt. Now, Wiglaf's grandson was Wiston. The Wiston. He was a prince of the Mercian kingdom. And in 840 AD, he was murdered by his great uncle. It was a bit of a scandal at the time, and he was duly interred, or his bones were duly interred in the crypt. And people were in the habit of visiting and paying homage to the, to the remains of the kings. You know, so people would come and go from the crypt. And word started to get around that if you went there in the years after Wiston had been interred, if you were ill or had an injury, you got better. So he became associated with miracles. Like a Lourdes, St. Wiston's crypt at Repton became a place that sick people wanted to get to because they would be healed by being in his presence and praying to him. And it became a busy place. Repton Abbey then became a busy destination for pilgrims who wanted to come and be cured. And they had to build extra entrances to get down into the crypt because so many people wanted to get there, they had to open it up a bit more. And if you go there to see the crypt at Whiston, and it's, it's under the floor of the modern 15th century parish church that's built on top of it, but when you go down into it, the steps are worn almost smooth. Wow. And you'd swear it was worn by water, but it's not. It's just been worn by decades and then centuries of people padding down the stairs to see Whiston's tomb. So for a while, Repton Abbey, with its association with St Wiston's crypt, became an important point of pilgrimage. You know, so the monks and the nuns are going about their business, but there's this crypt that pilgrims are coming from all over to visit, to be healed, to be made whole again. And it functions like that for 
quite a considerable period of time. But then it also becomes the focus of attention for another people entirely, that being the Vikings. Now, we know a bit about the Vikings. You know, the Vikings had arrived at Lindisfarne to make their presence felt. Uh, they established themselves on the Brocha Bursi, and gradually they were making inroads on the whole place. So they arrive at Lindisfarne in 793, and thereafter they never really go away again. They come every summer to raid and to pillage and to rape and to take slaves and all the rest of it, which is bad enough as far as the Anglo-Saxon Christian communities are concerned, because these Vikings are pagan. So, apart from anything else, they're unclean in the eyes of these Christian people. It's bad enough to be interfered with by anyone, but if you're Christian, to be handled by pagans is the worst of the worst. So the Vikings are coming and going, making a serious nuisance of themselves for decades. And then, in 865 AD, enough of them got together to create an invading army Rather than just two or three longships with some bearded warriors aboard come to create some mayhem, thousands of them came in 865. The intention being to take over, to conquer the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. Are they coming from all over Scandinavia? They're coming from, they're coming from Denmark, from Norway and from Sweden. There's some sort of combined and coordinated effort. They all arrive together. The first of the kingdoms to fall to them is East Anglia, then Northumbria. And by 873 AD, they're knocking on Mercia's door. So Mercia is the third of the seven Anglo-Saxon kingdoms to fall to the great heathen army, the Mikkel heathen Hera. By 873, they're at Repton. And the monks and nuns at Repton got word that they were coming. They got advance warning that they were on their way. And so they hightailed it out of there, taking with them the the precious relics of St Whiston. So they bundled him up in a blanket, his bones and his skull, and took it with them. And, And by the time the Vikings arrived, the abbey was to all intents and purposes deserted. So they took it as their winter headquarters. Because they're now... You know, they're part way through a, a sustained campaign to take over as much of the Anglo Saxon territory as they can. So they overwinter at Repton. They're on a roll. So why would they overwinter? Why not just carry on? Well, during winter, it, it, it's hard enough. You know, the, these places, these territories, they don't have roads that we would appreciate, they don't have shops. They don't have readily identifiable places where you can get food and supplies and all the rest of it. So for an invading army on the move, the good days of of spring and summer are difficult enough. But to keep an army on the move through the winter, when the rain and the snow turn vast tracts of territory into just bog and marsh, and you, you can't function, you can't get food. And so it makes sense just to overwinter somewhere. Repair your weapons, sharpen your swords, fix the, fix the ships. Do all the things that you need to do in, in readiness for continuing the campaign the next year. Because the Vikings, you know, that was, what, that was how they operated anyway. You know, we've discussed before how Viking is a, a verb, not a noun. You know, Viking's not something you are, it's something you do. So that in Denmark and in Norway and Sweden, they would plant the, they would plant the crops in the early spring. And now they had weeks and months to wait while the crops grew and ripened. And so in that downtime, they would go Viking. They would pile aboard their ships and and go across to see what they could get for themselves. Then they would come back in the autumn and and harvest the crops. So Viking raiding was a summertime activity anyway. And so it was for the the Mikkel heathen Hera, the great heathen army. Once they were in, winter was hopeless, so they would just hole up. And they might not all be in one place, but there was certainly a large force of them had decided to spend the winter at Repton. And so they turned the abbey into their base. Now, if you go to St Whiston's Parish Church now, you can go up the tower and look out. And if you look down, you can see quite clearly in the grass beyond the boundary of the church what is a former riverbed of the River Trent. Repton is in the floodplain of the River Trent. And the, the river has changed its course over the centuries. But you can see this place where the river once flowed 
And it was how the Vikings would have approached Repton. They would have come in by the River Trent. That's how they would have got there. You know, they wouldn't necessarily have marched. They would have come aboard their longships. So they don't just land at the coast, they come in land up the rivers. It's part of the genius of the way the Vikings operated. Everywhere they went in the world, they took their longships with them and they used them on rivers. And where the rivers got too shallow, they just picked them up. You've got dozens of big, strong boys and they just, they just pick it up and, and move it and roll it on logs and get to the next river and off you go again. So that was part of the, the modus operandi of, the, of these Viking invaders. So you're looking down from the tower at where the, where the ships would have moored and then what they, what they did was they dug a D-shaped ditch using the river as its spine, as the spine of the D, and then they dug two curving arms around that butted up against the gable ends of the abbey. So the doorways into the abbey became the doorway into their D-shaped enclosure. So they're protected on all sides. They're protected by the ditch, which is, you know, a, a deep ditch. They're protected by the river to the rear and to the front they're protected by the buildings of the abbey itself. And they can come and go through the doorway. And in that space, they could get the ships up onto the, the dry land, maybe repair them if they needed it, and just go about the business of, of camping and, and overwintering. And you can, see, you can see the earthworks still from the tower. You, you can't see that archaeologically the, the earthworks have been identified, but you can certainly see where the River Trent properly was. The whole place was uh, comprehensively excavated in the 1970s and 80s by a couple, Martin and Bertha Biddle. And they went to Repton in search of the Viking story. One discovery that they're famous for is the so-called Repton Warrior. In a grave quite close by the, the walls of the modern church, they found the grave of a big man, a six-foot-long skeleton, uh, buried with a sword, an iron sword, in its scabbard. And there was reason to believe that the scabbard had been lined with fleece or fur. You know that effect that you always see in, in movies of, of men fighting with swords? They draw the sword and it makes that kind of ting! Yeah. Distinctive noise never happened. For anyone that had a sword, because you want it to have a sharp edge on it, the scabbard would always be lined with something soft to protect the sharp edge. So that notion that people would like draw that grating noise would never have happened because it would destroy the sword or blunt it. The Repton warrior was buried with a, a sword in a, in a fleece lined scabbard, and around his neck, crucially, was a little Thor's hammer. Wow. Where Christians might have a cross, because he was a pagan and worshipped different gods, he had a little Thor hammer. It's called Mjolnir, which means the miller or the grinder of mountains. So he had this around his neck. So proof of proof were needed that he was a, a Viking. He had injuries to his skull, which are probably fatal, or... And, and in addition to his head wounds, damage to one of his thigh bones that suggested that his femoral artery might have been severed so that he bled out. But this would have been the kind of death that a Viking warrior wanted because the, the golden ticket that you needed to get into Valhalla, where you would feast all night and fight all day with the gods, you needed to die a violent death in battle. So the Repton warrior almost certainly had and had been buried by his fellows. Elsewhere in the Repton uh, churchyard, the Biddles found a mass grave of many, many Viking men and women, all buried at once, all buried together, around, around as a central point, the grave of another big man. Now, in all likelihood, the other men and women had probably died elsewhere, but their bodies had been brought to Repton to be buried around the leader to be buried as a mark of honour for the person in the centre. And there's very good reasons for thinking that the person in that central grave was none other than Ivar the Boneless, wow. who was one of the leaders of the great heathen army, the Mikkel heathen Hera, was, was led by Ivar the Boneless. And there's every reason to believe that that mass grave in Repton Abbey is his. So this is a figure who, who might almost have disappeared into folklore and myth, you know, just to be someone that you would read about in the sagas. But on account of the archaeological excavations at Repton, there he is. Ivar the Boneless is made real by the discovery of his mortal remains in all likelihood. 
What must it have been like to be an archaeologist on that dig? Well, I mean, that's, it, it, would, it would be a dream come true. In most instances, archaeologists working today, they, they rescue, really. So they're brought in where a motorway's about to be built, or HS2, or, or a big housing development. And it's an obligation on the part of the developers to bring in archaeologists to check, to see if there's anything that needs looking after in that way. So you could find anything or nothing. But you wouldn't know in advance what you were going to get. So you might find nothing at all. Or sometimes it could be medieval remains or it could be Neolithic remains. You would just have to see. But to go to excavate in the churchyard at Repton, hoping to find Vikings and then find Vikings, that doesn't often, it certainly doesn't always happen. So it would be a very, very exciting experience for sure. Especially to sketch in the outlines of an otherwise legendary figure like Ivar the Boneless. You know, to, to have reasons to believe that you've found one of the leaders of the great heathen army. So what you've got at Repton, sometime after 600 AD, an abbey is built, and it's used by a fairly aristocratic bunch of monks and nuns, people coming in from the, the local noble families, for a while there's a baptistry where Christians are made, where, where pagans are converted to Christianity and born again. Then that baptistry is turned into a crypt for kings, and kings are buried there. Eventually there's a scandalous murder of a Mercian prince, Whiston, murdered by his great uncle, and he is interred there, possibly as a kind of a post-mortem apology. They've probably given him a grand send-off to account for the circumstances of his death. And then in the years following his internment in the crypt, people start to experience miracles there that are attributed to his remains. And so Repton Abbey becomes a focal point for pilgrims from all over who are, who are coming in to be, to be cured. Then, horror of horrors, in 865, the Vikings arrive in Anglo-Saxon Britain. And by 873, they're coming to Repton. They're going to conquer Mercia. And so that religious community gathers up its relics, including Whiston's bones, and they get themselves out of there just in time. And the Vikings arrive and they overwinter in Repton in 873 AD. And at some point during the tenure of the great heathen army in, the Anglo -Saxon, in Anglo Saxon Mercia, they bury some of their dead. The one we know as the Repton warrior, and possibly Ivar the Boneless leader of the great heathen army and known to have died in battle with the Anglo-Saxons. And it's all there. Now, if you go and visit the place today, you come into Little Repton, little, quiet, pretty Repton, and you make your way to the parish church of St Wissons, and as soon as you walk through the gates and you're walking across that close-cropped grass around the gravestones, you can start to imagine that that close-cropped grass is like a, a shroud over the past. It's like a grandmother's blanket laid over her dead. And you walk into the church, which, as far as we're concerned, is quite modern, built sometime between the 13th and the 15th centuries. And down a set of stairs from inside that church, you go down those worn steps and you're into the stone crypt that once upon a time had Whiston's bones in it. And it's a beautiful little architectural space in its own right. You've got three rows of three domes forming the roof and the whole thing is held up by four stone pillars and they've got that kind of um, barley sugar twisted look about them. And there's just no escaping the sensation that you've walked into an air bubble that's submerged beneath the modern world. You've walked into an Anglo-Saxon bubble. John Betjeman, the poet laureate, visited St Wiston's Parish Church and went down into the crypt. And he subsequently described the little space. It's a tiny little claustrophobic space. He said it was holy air encased in stone, which is a perfect, perfect description of it. Holy it is a word that people tend to associate with, well, certainly the Christian religion, but they think of things religious being holy. But holy is an ancient word. 
It, it predates religion as we understand it. It has proto-Indo-European roots, which means it goes all the way back to the oldest languages that came out of the kind of eastern part of Europe, gradually came across the European continent, and they're the, they're the ancestors of our relic languages like Gaelic and Irish Gaelic and Welsh. Those all come from the old proto-Indo-European languages. And holy is, has the deepest roots, and it means that which must be preserved intact, that which must not be violated. That's what holy means, that which must be preserved intact. And anyone in the right mind going down into that little space of stone beneath the parish church of St Wiston's would surely agree that that was a place that was holy, that should be preserved and maintained intact. And for the duration of the time that you spend down in that little crypt, you could be forgiven for thinking that you've left the 21st century behind and you're breathing and living in Anglo-Saxon air. This mighty army is here. He's conquered three kingdoms. You'd be pretty worried come spring if you were one of the four that were left, wouldn't you? Yes. It's that kind of divide and conquer approach, I suppose. It's not as though, this is before there was an England. In the not too distant future, there will be an England. But at the time when the, the great heathen army was on the rampage, there was no England. It was seven independent, sometimes warring kingdoms. So the Vikings didn't have to come in and attack England they were able to pick off each independent kingdom in its own right, go after them one at a time. And once they had knocked off one, like East Anglia, then their reputation starts to go before them. So by the time they're coming on to Northumbria, the Northumbrians know that they've already beaten the East Anglians and that they're to be taken seriously. So there's an element of fear. Then they defeat the Northumbrians. That's two for two. And a momentum starts to build, such that by the time they're coming into Mercia, word goes before them, saying, these guys have already defeated not just the East Anglians, but also the Northumbrians, and now they're coming here. And you don't have standing armies. You know, a, a king has to raise an army. And, and maybe the locals aren't in the mood to fight. Maybe as many people are just hightailing it out of the district, just to get away. So it becomes a serious problem to, to turn and stand and fight an enemy that's already defeated two kingdoms. So there's an element of momentum that becomes as important as anything else. And the Viking army that comes into Mercia in 873 is a victorious army that has known only success. It's known only victory. So there are odds reversal here and there, but broadly speaking, they're on a winning streak. And that begins to look in 873 like a momentum that might see them wash right across the whole of the territory. You know, they've knocked out three, there's four to go, and there's everything to play for. A king made me a monarch who earned the epithet great, a soldier who led the resistance against the Mickle heathen Hera, unifying the southern half of the British Isles, a ruler with a reputation for learning, for good governance and for graciousness. This is a golden masterpiece, over a thousand years old, and it marks his reign. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles, Check out Neil Oliver Love Letter, the podcast's Instagram account. And to ensure you get each new episode of the podcast as it goes live, don't forget to subscribe, write a review and share with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places and it's published by Transworld. 
Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. The social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. <laughs>